The following is an address to the nation by Prime Minister Dr. The Right Honorable Keith Mitchell. Fellow Grenadians, Caraconians, and Peter Martinicans all, in recent weeks, there has been a heightened sense of anxiety about a possible opening of our borders. The origin of this is understandable, as we see daily reports of increased rate of infections, particularly in the United States, which is one of our main source of markets for visitors. As the global pandemic continues to spiral out of control, there is corresponding increase in the potential for importation of the virus if we open our borders without the necessary protocols in place. At this point, we continue to work on the finalization of protocols before we begin to accept commercial flights. Many are wishing we can remain in a protective bubble that has kept us safe since March and that we can maintain the COVID-free status announced earlier this month. However, this is not a practical long-term option as Caribbean countries may not have reached consensus and when we reopen more borders. But given the importance of tourism, this is generally regarded as one of the critical milestones in the effort to restart economies. The timing, however, must be right. And public health remain of paramount importance. Speaking of timing, I know many of you were disappointed when this national address was postponed last Sunday and that there was much speculation about the reason why. With the repatriation flight from the United States arriving just two days before the planned speech, we had to ensure that all testing and retesting procedures were carried out so that I can accurately report to the nation on Grenada's current COVID-19 status. Thankfully, no new cases have been confirmed. I understand the plight of our nationals who have been stranded overseas for months. I'm also aware of keen anticipation of others to visit a country that has successfully managed the pandemic and have prevented community spread and achieve COVID-free status. However, when we consider the overarching priority to protect our citizens, we must continue to do all that we can to limit the potential importation of that disease. To our nationals who were recently repatriated from cruise ships, the United Kingdom and the United States after several weeks of uncertainty, I say welcome home. We urge your fullest cooperation in adhering to the established protocols. We cannot afford to be selfish in the fight against COVID-19, as our actions or inactions can impact on the health and well-being of others. Our protocols may be perceived as rigorous, but they have to be because public health and safety are at risk. We have tested and evaluated the protocols and identified areas for improvement. Therefore, for the immediate future, Grenada will only continue to welcome chartered flights and these offer greater levels of due diligence with respect to the established protocols, which include testing before departure, testing upon arrival, and agreement to bear the cost of quarantine. Commercial airlines have thus far 
not agree to make it mandatory for passengers to test prior to travel. And this is contrary to Grenada's protocols. Sisters and brothers, although the timing is not right now, the day will come when commercial flights will resume. Therefore, training sessions have been organized for workers in the accommodation sector, transport and food and beverage sectors, as we strive for consistency in our collective approach to dealing with visitors. We are entering the next phase in this fight against COVID-19. I must recognize and commend the dedication and valuable contribution made by the COVID subcommittee headed by Minister of Health, Nicholas Steele. The several task force for rebuilding the Grenada economy and the various sector-based cabinet-appointed subcommittees. Over the last few months, you have all provided selfless service to the government and people of Grenada, Caraco, and Peter Martinique. And for that, we thank all of you. Your commitment and dedication to the task at hand has helped us to get us through one of the most difficult periods in our country's history. Your service is greatly appreciated. The COVID subcommittee is expected to wrap up its work at the end of July. Thereafter, government decision-making on matters such as protocols, regulations, quarantine, and testing will be guided by a national advisory committee. This committee will draw upon the expertise of some of the same persons who have been involved thus far, but our approach will be different. The details will be announced later when we have finalized the composition of this new advisory body and the terms of its engagement. Sisters and brothers, in recent weeks, government has granted additional easements in the COVID-19 regulations to allow more and more businesses to operate in keeping with established guidelines for the various sectors. Further easement in operational hours is imminent, as Cabinet will be recommending that as of Tuesday, June 30th, 2020, the curfew is extended from 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. It is anticipated that the extended hours will continue to spur increased economic activity. The construction sector, which is anticipated to be the driver of our economic recovery, is already showing significant activity. Since the resumption of work in that sector in May, more than 4,000 Grenadians have either resumed work or have been hired to work on various projects across our country. To date, the Ministry of Infrastructural Development has received over 544 applications for approval to resume or start work on private projects. Additionally, there are several major public sector projects in various stages of preparation for the commencement of work. These include several feeder and other roads, as well as other major infrastructural development. Since the lockdown was instituted in March, it has been a welcome sight to see many persons returning to backyard gardening. At the government level, we continue to underscore the importance of the agricultural sector in promoting greater food security and to, provoke, to provide in significant financial resources that have been made available for various initiatives, including price support payments for cocoa and nutmeg farmers. These resources are not intended to support the administrative affairs of the Grenada Cocoa Association and the Grenada Nutmeg Associations, but rather 
It must go directly to the pockets of farmers. The pandemic has compounded the financial hardship faced by many, and in particular the farming community. As in numerous instances before, the situation highlights the need for urgent action to address the long-term financial viability of the cocoa and nutmeg associations and the ability to safeguard the livelihood of farmers. Therein lies the rationale for the proposed merger, which is a recommendation dating as far back as the 1990s. Unfortunately, years of inaction have paralyzed the associations, leading to chronic and acute financial challenges, similar to the current situation, which necessitated yet another injection of capital by government to ensure the survival of the associations. To those who question, why now? The COVID-19 pandemic has illustrated in no uncertain terms that it cannot be business as usual. We must move speedily, but with precision, to address the governance and management structure of the commodity boards, which successive consultancies have shown to be inadequate and archaic. It is said that in every crisis, there are opportunities. This pandemic has provided a crucial opportunity to modernize the operation of the commodity boards, to strengthen the institutional capacity and the viability of the governance structure, and to liberalize the market and improve the global competitiveness of our traditional crops. A successful merger will accomplish this, and most importantly, will allow farmers to be at the forefront. Another long-standing recommendation that government will seek to implement. We expect the merger of the association and the liberalization of the sector to lead to better prices for cocoa and nutmeg farmers, while also allowing them a chance of real ownership and shareholding in the commodity boards, something that does not exist at this time. As it is now, farmers, and I repeat, do not own shares in the Grenada Cocoa Association or the Grenada Nutmeg Association. Government has no intention to take over the affairs of, of the associations but rather, governments seek to empower the country's cocoa and nutmeg farmers and to improve the financial returns. Fellow Grenadians, Caracuni and Peter Martinik and all, just as many of you have experienced trying circumstances since the onset of the pandemic, government too has had its fair share of challenges. Revenue collection has declined by almost 50%, but we continue to bring relief to the population through the economic stimulus package. To date, more than 4,000 Grenadians have benefited either from payroll support to businesses or from income support to self-employed persons. We are continuously evaluating the categories of persons eligible to benefit and have made some adjustments in recent times. Hairdressers, barbers, and market vendors are now included among the beneficiaries. Requests have also been submitted by employees of Liat and several other places who have received little or no income and are facing imminent threat of unemployment. Additionally, as the duration of the pandemic increases, government is now actively considering extending the period of support granted to hotel workers for a further three months. Another 2,000 Grenadians have also started receiving their unemployment assistance from the National Insurance Scheme. 
In addition, several others have a capitalized on concessionary financing offered through the Grenada Development Bank and the Small Business Development Fund as part of the stimulus package. Sisters and brothers, this in no way suggests that we have helped everyone who needs help. But I can assure you that we continue to work on your behalf. Government is therefore sympathetic to the plight of workers dealing with reduced income and loss of jobs. But the reality is that government itself is limited by the significant decline in revenue. Therefore, as we consider additional requests for assistance, we also have to monitor the country's fiscal position to ensure that we are not overreaching. Public transportation has been restored for most part, but this was not without hiccups. We are now at the stage where we can discuss in an amicable manner critical matters relative to this very important service. Bus operators, like many others, they face significant challenges during the lockdown. And government has already provided relief through the stimulus package because more than 500 of them have benefited up to date. In addition, government is spending $50,000 monthly to ensure that all buses are properly sanitized after every trip. To the many students across the nation, we continue to be very measured in our approach to facilitate a return to classroom. For those preparing for exams, we wish you the very best. And for the new graduates, we are incredibly proud of you for successfully completing this phase of your journey in the midst of a global health crisis. Sisters and brothers, this is difficult time for everyone but it also presents an opportunity for us to demonstrate that we are truly our brother's keeper. Government welcome, therefore, all efforts intended to bring relief to people affected by the pandemic. And we gladly recognize and give credit to all who make such contributions. However, even in giving, there are basic fundamental principles that must be followed. Therefore, all stakeholders wishing to contribute in one way or another must collaborate with the management body of the intended beneficiaries. In many instances, there are specific guidelines for accepting donations, and these must be followed. Additionally, there are specific COVID-19 protocols, and these too must be followed. In our haste to do good, we should not forget to collaborate with the relevant authorities, and this is fundamentally basic, to ensure we achieve the desired outcomes that we all wish. I therefore make a special appeal here to employers at this time, to trade union leaders, and landlords, you are well placed to inspire positivity in this period of crisis. As leaders, we urge employers to help ease the burden and allay the fears of the employers in this very critical time. We urge trade union leaders at this time to be more reasonable in their demands and as landlords and encourage them to be more sensitive to the predicament faced by many tenants, especially those with good track records who are unable to operate their businesses have, or have lost their jobs at this time. Eviction should not be preferred course of action at this time. Sisters and brothers, the ongoing pandemic continues to test the resilience of our people and our nation. From an economic perspective, 
We are confident of Grenada's recovery from the far-reaching impact of COVID-19. There is no denying that the road back will be a long one, but through resilience and unity, I am confident we will recover and build back even better. Through informed leadership, collaboration among stakeholders, and cooperation of you, the Grenadian public, we have successfully managed the pandemic in Grenada so far. We are now at a critical juncture. The science says Grenada is COVID free. But we cannot be lulled into thinking that the battle has been won. I have observed growing signs of complacency with persons being less diligent about wearing their mask and maintaining physical distance. Sisters and brothers, the fight against this acutely volatile disease is far from over. And we must maintain the protocols that have served us well for the past few months. In closing, I must offer sincere gratitude to all our frontline workers. It is impossible to imagine getting through this challenging period without the considerable sacrifices you have all made in the line of duty. The government and people of Grenada, Caraco, and Pini Martinic are sincerely appreciative for all that you have done and continue to do. I thank you. The proceeding was an address to the nation by Prime Minister Dr. The Right Honorable Keith Mitchell. today to address a news report on claims that the ministry and the principal of the St. Davis Catholic Secondary School stopped the donation of food to students by an organization of the National Democratic Congress. Your statements on that um, and what exactly was or is supposed to happen in, in this regard. We applaud persons for taking initiative you know, and reaching out where they see a need because the ministry can't do it alone. It's all about partnership, building community, and all of that. But it's just that we need to know, right, when these things are happening. We shouldn't be hearing it out there because the access, that if persons have to come onto the compound, and even the protocol for the um, COVID, it says that we have to minimize the entry of visitors onto the compound and all of that. Um, I just want to just draw your attention to how serious that feeding of children is taking in the Act, Section 180. It speaks about the quality of... Um, service well services goods food beverage and any other item on the premises of a public or assisted private educational institution without the written permission of the chief education officer okay it says that the chief education officer must be involved when food and so is being given to students on the school compound now i take the implementation of the act very seriously I don't go on feelings to say what I feel, you know. There, there's an act that we have to be guided by. And if we do that, then we ensure that whatever actions we take are in accordance with the act, and then no one can hold us responsible for poor implementation of the act. So this is what I can say, you know, as far as what has transpired. We did not shut down any program. But at the same time, we have to remind principals and members of the general public that there are protocols. So even above us at this stage, there is a COVID-19 protocol. We had to submit that before we could have open school, even though the act says the chief and the minister can open school in a state of emergency and so on. There is a body above us as in this case, the COVID-19 regulations. So we could not just decide, okay, school open. When they said close school, we had to close school, short notice. But this is where we are right now. So we are guided by the COVID-19 protocol, and every citizen of Grenada has to abide. You know, they may choose not to, but there are consequences. Stay up to date with all that's happening with the new national party, NNP. Send us a message via text 
or WhatsApp on 405-8683 with your name, email, and constituency. Stay in the know with NNB. Get updated. 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 Ministry of Education dismisses claims. We'll have details to this story and more in the National Report. With the details to the news for Friday, June 26, 2020, I am Rakesha St. Louis. Chief Education Officer Mrs. Angela Finlay has strongly refuted claims by a political donor organization that the ministry has instructed secondary schools to refuse food donations made to fifth form students. The CEO told the government's information service on Friday that no such instruction was given. She explained that by the second week of June, when students returned to the classrooms, the ministry's school feeding program resumed. We get more in this report from trainee reporter Colleen Peters. During an interview with the Government Information Service on Friday, Chief Education Officer Mrs. Angela Finley said the news came as a shock to officials at the ministry since no such directive was given. She says the ministry and schools are guided by the Education Act, which clearly outlines Section 180, that the Chief Education Officer must give written permission towards services, goods, food, and beverage on the premises of a public or assisted private school. Mrs. Finley explained that since schools reopened in June, the ministry and schools are being guided by COVID-19 regulations. There's an act that we have to be guided by. And if we do that, then we ensure that whatever actions we take are in accordance with the act and then no one can hold us responsible for poor implementation of the act. So this is what I can say you know, as far as what is transpired, we did not shut down any program, but at the same time, we have to remind principals and members of the general public that there are protocols, so even above us at this stage, there is a COVID-19 protocol. We had to submit that before we could have open school, even though the act says the chief and the minister can open school in a state of emergency and so on. There's a body above us as in this case, the COVID-19 regulations. The CEO described as false claims that schools were reopened with no structures in place for school feeding, leaving donor organizations to assist the institutions. She explained that there were no dire need for school donations since the ministry made adequate provisions for the school feeding programs prior to the closure and upon reopening. The St. Davis Catholic Secondary School was the institution highlighted in a story by a local media entity. Principal Gary Jones told GIS on Friday that he never gave instructions to refuse food donations made by the organization, but rather asked for a temporary halt until he was able to submit a report to his superior to ensure that there were no breach in protocol. Jones says as principal, he had no evidence that the organization followed the correct channels before making the donations. Yesterday, I instructed one of my teachers to request a temporary stoppage of the program because I needed to verify that all of the, the, all of the deliveries, the delivery program, was in keeping with the guidelines of providing services to schools. So it is for that reason the St. Davis Catholic Secondary School is not receiving any delivery today. I think it would be very unfortunate that anybody okay, view this as a negative act on the part of by, on the, by, on the part of the principal to do so. For the National Report, I am Carleen Peters. Thank you, Carleen.
Continuing, Governor of the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank, Dr. Timothy Antoine, says CARICOM countries are in need of a debt standstill on long-term debt. This bailout, he says, will provide an opportunity for countries to recover from the effects of the global pandemic, COVID-19. Governor Antoine was a guest on the 2020 Caribbean Economic Forum on Thursday, where governors of the Caribbean delved into financial projections, successes, concerns, and highlighted plans for years ahead. According to Governor Antoine, countries are clamoring for a two-year debt standstill agreement. To be able to, to manage their obligations to the, to the citizens, um, provide basic services, and to take care of of course, all the COVID-19 related expenditure. So here you have a situation where the revenues have plummeted in some cases by as much as 50%. Uh, at the same time, uh, uh, COVID-19 expenditures ha have grown exponentially. What our region and certainly the ECCU would, would wish is to see a debt stand still on the longer term debt. So I make a distinction between short term debt treasury bills um, through, for example, the regional government securities market. We continue to operate that market in a normal way. Um, we are rolling over, continuing to make issues, uh, issuances. And, and in fact, up to uh, earlier this week, I believe it was, or last week, we had a, earlier this week actually, an oversubscription on the regional government securities market. Governor Antoine says there was a 3.5% projected growth for the Eastern Caribbean Currency Union prior to the pandemic. However, all countries except Guyana will contract by 10 to 20%. Our latest projection is that we will contract, the ECCU will contract by between 10 and 20% this year alone. So you can see the dramatic change in the economic fortunes of our currency union as a result of the pandemic. But of course, Julian, you would appreciate that this impact is not unique to the ECCU. In fact, the world is facing its worst economic crisis in almost 100 years. Uh, we're told that the global economy this year will contract by at least 5% based on the IMF estimates as of yesterday. And we know the impact has been great on large and small economies. Uh, the U.S. is going to contract by 8%, the U.K. by 10%. Africa, for the first time in 25 years, will actually contract. And, and of course, all countries in the, in the CARICOM area, with the exception of Guyana, will contract this year. We're all in recession. This is The National Report. We'll have more news after the break. Do you still have EC1 and 2 cent coins? If you do, then you have until the end of this month, 30th June, to spend them, exchange, or deposit them at your commercial bank. After 30th June, you will not be able to use your one and two cents as they will no longer be legal tender. Find them, spend them, exchange, or deposit them at your commercial bank. Act now and receive value for your one and two cent coins by 30th June. Welcome back. Kudos for the government of Grenada, the COVID-19 response team, and other stakeholders for implementing World Health Organization standard protocols for cruise ship workers returning home. Jerome Bowen is the Assistant Human Resource Operations Manager for Norwegian Cruise Line Holdings. He says the process was well executed and in keeping with international standards. For that, we want to say thank you to the Minister of Tourism and Civil Aviation, Minister Cohen, I think, and um, Minister, Minister Nicholas of Steele, Health. Yes. Minister of Health and Minister his whole Health. team, who helped, uh, you know, in making this a smooth transition for us, you know. We were greeted at the, 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 the terminal. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. They had all the tests and everything waiting for us. They took time to explain the whole process to us, you know, yes. mm -hmm. and everything just ran smoothly. We didn't have any problems at all, so we thank them and we say kudos to them for a job well done. Mr. Bowen, who was a guest on the weekly GIS program, Distance Makes the Difference, says Grenadians need not be scared to mingle with the workers after completion of their 14-day mandatory quarantine because cruise lines are one of the strictest industries when it comes to hygiene. The only how a crew member would have been able to pick up antibodies or corona or something like that is if he had show leave, right? Mm -hmm. 
he went to show and he would have come in contact with somebody who had it, right? Yeah. As far as our cruise line is concerned, most of the crew, if not all of our crew, didn't have COVID. And that is because when we got the news that we had to disembark the guests and sail, most of us were on board and didn't see land until now. So yeah. there was no way for us to come in contact with anybody who would have spread it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then we, we do have daily temperature checks, as uh, Samantha was saying. We mm -hmm. have sanitizers around the ships. And these are things that we've been doing long before COVID, you know? Okay. The wash hand protocol has always been in place with the food line industry. And this is because we try to prevent what is called GI. And GI is a big thing on ships. And, That's true. and because of that, we've, we've always had these measures in place. So it was quite difficult for us to contract anything like COVID unless we went ashore and mingled with somebody ashore. So it's very disheartening when you hear people say that, oh, they're ship members and they're full of mm -hmm. corona, you know, we don't want them here. Jerome says he and other colleagues are all anxious to return to work once the CDC raises the no seal ban in the U.S. He says once that is done, his company will begin a phased approach of ships back into operation. Finally, in the news, in an effort to promote food and nutrition security by increasing local banana production, 14 farmers were recipients of tissue culture banana plants from the Ministry of Agriculture. As we hear in this report, the farmers received their plants during a special handing over ceremony at the Moran Plant Propagation Station. Banana production is on the cusp of resurgence as the Ministry of Agriculture and Lands implements a pilot project which affords 14 local farmers an opportunity to each establish one acre of tissue culture banana plants. A committee comprising of six from departments including extension, agronomy, land use and pest management assessed over 50 farms in May belonging to farmers that expressed interest in the plants. Adhering to the COVID-19 health and safety guidelines, the 14 farmers were separated in two batches and offered lessons on fertilizer application, pest management such as the management of the moco disease and black cigatoka, irrigation, land preparation and others. These trainings were done at the Marable Plant Propagation Station and another at Belvedere at Carlton Gully's farm. We hope that you would continue to work close to the Ministry of Agriculture that you would help to move this banana um, industry forward, develop the production line, the production level, so that we can feed ourselves, we can sustain ourselves, and we don't have to, as um, Mr. Shea said, we don't have to go out of Grenada to get bananas to feed ourselves and to, to keep things going here. That was Minister for Agriculture and Lands, Honorable Yulan Bain Hosford, addressing recipients at a short handover ceremony at the Moran Propagation Station on Thursday. Also in attendance was Parliamentary Representative for St. John, Honorable Alvin Dabriel. He underscored the many benefits that can be derived from the banana industry. We are blessed with good soil, so bananas is one of the products that we could uh, develop because you could make so many things from it. You see, even you see bananas, dried bananas in cereal in the supermarket. They're now making banana flour. You use the, there are many things you could do from the straw of the, the bananas. And it's, it's tremendous the amount of potential that it has. Known for its properties, the ministry imported the William variety for injection into local production with the aim of boosting food and nutrition security. Two of the benefiting farmers, Claudia Speer and Ron Alexander, say this is a plus for the banana sector. It's a very happy, happy feeling for, for me. The tissue culture is always welcome by us. We got clean plants, uh, plants free of diseases, so that is a plus. So you don't have to worry about the plants getting moco. So it's 600 plants, so indeed it will be a big push for the banana industry in Grenada. 
The ministry will establish these 14 acres of bananas with farmers in various agroecological zones, the middle belt, lower areas and higher zones. The ministry will keep all records from this project to do a financial analysis to verify the profitability of the crop. Each farmer received a total of 600 banana plants for propagation, while two acres of the imported variety will be propagated at the plant propagation stations managed by the Ministry of Agriculture to provide additional planting material. For the Ministry of Agriculture and Lands, I am Mina Boka. That story just ended the national report for today, Friday, June 26th. Let's recap the top story. Ministry of Education dismisses claims. On behalf of the entire news team here at the Government Information Service, I am Rakesha St. Louis saying thank you for joining us. Until next time. Stay up to date with all that's happening with the new national party, NNP. Send us a message via text or WhatsApp on 405-8683 with your name, email, and constituency. Stay in the know with NNP. Get updated. updated. updated.